My father, God rest his soul, used to be a sheriff's deputy over in Culberson County, Texas. Whoever said everything is bigger in Texas didn't get around to letting the Culberson Sheriff's Department know that. I've seen public bathrooms bigger than their office, but I suppose that's on account of how little crime there is out there. They're based in the place that I grew up, a small town about a hundred miles east of El Paso called Van Horn. Van Horn is the kind of place where a seven-course meal consists of a possum and a six-pack. I'm only joking, but really, it's got two trailer parks, one Wendy's, and a golf course once voted the worst in the country. I still have a little misplaced affection for the place, but it's safe to say that not much happens in Culberson County. When I was a kid, I'd ask my pa about all the bad guys that he caught. He'd sit me on his knee, tell me about the bank robbery he stopped or the high-speed chase he'd been on that day. But really, it was all nonsense. Most things he did would absolutely bore you to tears and the other stuff wasn't fit for a child's ears. He only told me that years later at a family barbecue, playfully embarrassing me in front of the girlfriend that eventually became my wife. I didn't mind. It made sense that he protected me from all the darker things that he dealt with. And that's what a good father does. But then later on, just after sundown, we were having some cold ones around the fire pit when we revisited my dad's time as a deputy. He was retired by that time. All the guys he'd been active with were either dead or fishing themselves to death down on South Padre Island. And then combined with the fact that I was no longer a kid and I figured I could ask him about some of the more intense moments of his career. Now, I already knew that during his time in the department, one of Dad's fellow deputies had made the ultimate sacrifice, but what I didn't know is that my dad had been there to witness it. But to explain how he ended up in a situation where two sworn peace officers were murdered in cold blood, Dad had to go back and tell me another man's story, and that man's name was Henry Crow. Henry lived with his father on a small piece of land a few miles out of town and went to the same high school as my dad and uncle. They were both full-blood Comanche, and the black eyes that he came to school with spoke volumes about the conditions at home. His father, Harlan, did okay as an auto mechanic for a while, but fell apart after the death of Henry's mother. After that, all he did was drink and cause trouble whenever he ventured into town for more liquor. Henry was a quiet kid who rarely socialized with other boys. He preferred the solitude of shooting jackrabbits at sundown after school and scrapped all the way to the 11th grade before the accident that killed his father. Harlan Crow was known to drive drunk on occasion and whenever he did, deputies would pull him over, arrest him, and then throw him in the drunk tank for a night to sober up. These days, they'd have carted him off to jail on his third strike, but. I guess the sheriff decided that there was no need for any higher involvement. Harlan had suffered enough. But then one day, Harlan was as drunk as Cooter Brown, didn't pull over, and took the cops on high-speed highway pursuit that ended up somewhere near Pine Springs, I guess. Harlan ended up driving off the road, then dying in the wreckage. But whether it was his own sloppy driving or a pit maneuver gone wrong remains hotly debated to this day. Aside from his son, Harlan Crow had no known relatives to claim his body, and when asked, Henry declined to receive it. Harlan was cremated at the Culberson County Coroner's Office and then interred in a small, undignified mausoleum in Van Horn Cemetery. Henry dropped out of high school shortly afterward and then disappeared from town. The only clue to his destination was a remark that he'd made to the vice principal, one about hitching a ride to El Paso to talk to an army recruiter. By the time Henry left town, my father was on his way to being a newly minted deputy sheriff. Not long after he earned his badge, he met my mother and they started dating. That must have been around 61 or 62 and my dad recalled a more innocent and peaceful time then. But then in November of 63, as you know, the president was assassinated and according to my dad, a black cloud hung over all of America. Vietnam. Charles Whitman, Detroit, Manson, Kent State, all part of the same nightmare we've never really woken up from. By the summer of 1970, my dad had gotten married, bought a house, and had just gotten around to talking kids with my mom, when who should walk back into town for almost 10 years of being away but Henry Crow. 
He'd been walking around a grocery store on West Broadway for around 20 minutes before someone realized who he was. He paid for a bunch of canned food and cash and then walked the three miles out of town to the old derelict house that he grew up in. A deputy paid him a visit the next day just to confirm the rumors. Henry told him that he had some business to attend to in town and would be moving on once it concluded. He refused to say any more and then politely asked the deputy to leave the property. And needless to say, such an ominous suggestion caused the people of Van Horn a great deal of concern as you might expect. Some believed Henry had returned to resume the same role his father had played as the town's chief troublemaker, while others said he'd return for revenge. Henry had always been cold and withdrawn, but upon his return, he was like a walking AC unit and had people shaking in their boots wherever he went. He had an air about him, I guess is what I'm trying to say. My dad said that much was true. He personally asked Henry how he'd been all those years and more importantly, where he'd been all those years. Henry just told him that he'd been around, and while my dad was satisfied with him maintaining his privacy, the county sheriff was not. He was aware of the rumor that Henry had visited an army recruiter before leaving town, and being a former soldier himself, he was able to make a few calls to confirm if Henry had served or not. The sheriff discovered that not only had he served, but after a few years with the rangers of the 75th Infantry, his service record went completely dark. After his first tour of Vietnam, it was all classified operations, redacted after action reports and references to top-secret CIA intelligence reports, believe it or not, and there was a hint of where Crow had been, or what he'd been doing, but his medals and citations spoke volumes, two silver stars, and three purple hearts. For those unsure of what that means, it means Henry Crow almost died a total of five times during his tours of wherever they sent him and two of those times had been while killing a whole lot of enemy soldiers. Henry wasn't some drifter, who wandered back into town to sell his daddy's old house. He was a highly trained killing machine, who no doubt had taken scores of lives in the time that he'd been away. As you can imagine, this made everyone in town very nervous, and law enforcement in particular. If Henry had indeed returned to Van Horde to seek revenge, there was no telling how much destruction he could sow before they stopped him, if they could even stop him at all, that is. Every couple of days, Henry would walk the three miles into town to visit a real estate attorney, and folks assumed that he was waiting to sell the house before he unleashed his wrath on them, but somehow, finding out that he was sticking around was even more ominous. He didn't visit the gun store or pick up a few 50-pound bags of fertilizer. Hell, he didn't even have a car and walked everywhere he needed to be. All he ever bought were groceries and hardware supplies, carrying them back to the old crow house when he needed them. All the sheriff and his deputies could do, my pa included, was watch, wait, and hope that when the time came, there'd be a minimal amount of bloodshed. And then finally, in early September of 1970, it started. Early one morning, the gravedigger at the Van Horn Cemetery stopped by the sheriff's office to report several acts of vandalism, destruction of property, and grave robbing. In the middle of the night, someone had carved obscenities into a great many of the gravestones, terrible things too, wishing inferno on the dead while hailing Satan and all of his minions. On top of that, several recently interred corpses had been exhumed and desecrated, Remains had been fashioned into obscene poses while some body parts had been removed from the cemetery. But perhaps the most concerning and most damning of all details was the fact that the cemetery's small mausoleum had been raided. The place had been almost completely trashed with an inch-thick layer of ash and broken ceramics on the cold stone floor. And only one had been stolen, that of Henry's long-dead father, Harlan Crow. When half a dozen deputies paid Henry a visit, he denied any involvement, but although he was never accused, arrested, or charged, the court of public opinion had already passed a verdict. The way the townsfolk saw it, Henry Crow was obviously to blame. He'd gone to reclaim his father's remains and had desecrated the other graves as a sort of appetizer before a dish of ice-cold revenge in his eyes. They didn't care if the sheriff told them Henry wasn't a suspect and that all he wanted was to be left alone. To them, it was clear. Henry was out to get them, and if the sheriff and his deputies weren't good for stopping him, then 
what good were they in the first place? Pa says that was the first sign that folks were losing their trust in the law. They wanted Henry gone, and if the sheriff wouldn't do it, someone was going to step up and do it for him. Tensions increased even more after the owner of a local construction company, Holt Williger, confronted Henry on one of his grocery runs. Holt was a contractor whose bills would balloon with all kinds of unexpected expenses before a job was done. Pa said that he was so crooked that you couldn't tell from his tracks if he was coming or going. Henry just ignored him, but angered Holt even more. Henry tried to walk away. Holt raised a fist in anger, but he was all hat and no cattle, as they say, and was lying in the dirt before it could even swing. It wouldn't have been so bad if half the town hadn't been watching, but they were. Holt walked away with nothing but wounded pride, but as my pa told me, those kinds of wounds are fast festering in a man like Holt Williger. Things carried on that way for a while, with tensions increasing by the day, or rather by the night. Someone was sneaking around the residential neighborhoods at night, climbing into their backyards, peering through their windows, someone who looked a lot like Henry Crow. This went on for a few nights, until finally a little girl doesn't return home after playing outside with her friends. The family contact the sheriff's office, but they also alert their friends and neighbors, and soon half the town were running around like a bunch of one-eyed dogs in a smokehouse. They didn't mean anything bad by it, and they certainly didn't implicate a certain newly returned veteran, but when the news reached Holt Williger and his friends, they decided to take the law into their own hands and use the panic and the chaos to settle their score. They piled into their trucks with their rifles and their shotguns and then gunned it over to the old crow place to move Henry on for good. But then it just so happened that they were spotted by a patrolling deputy who immediately radioed it into the sheriff and seconds later, a handful of the deputies were diverted away from the search and sent to apprehend the lynch mob on their way to the crow place, and my father was one of those deputies. They rolled up behind the lynch mob, cherries and berries flashing, but they couldn't stop until they were right outside the crow place. The deputies were thinking that they could keep the peace with just a few polite words, but the situation was way beyond reasoning. Between the incidents at the cemetery, the confrontation between Holt and Henry, and now this missing girl, it was like folks had temporarily lost their minds. Instead of throwing down their weapons, the seven or eight members of the lynch mob realized that they had three deputies completely outgunned, and the way they saw it, how dare these cops prevent them from saving a little girl's life. Henry could have been doing God knows what to her in there, and they needed to find him, and he needed to die and if a few deputies had to die along the way, their deaths could quite easily be blamed on Henry. Pa said that he saw it in one man's eye before a shot was even fired. The situation was out of control, and he was already backing up behind his patrol car when the first bullets came at them. One deputy was dead before he even hit the dirt. Another was wounded, but managed to return fire. My pa, on the other hand, he thought that he could hear the fat lady singing, as he said. Bullets are hitting all around him, closer and closer with every shot fired in his buddy, is bleeding real bad a few feet away, and if he doesn't go get help soon, he's going to die. Then just when he's considering just surrendering and hoping for the best, he hears a bunch of more shots coming from someplace else, and the lynch mob began to scream. More shots rang out, careful ones this time, not just spraying and praying, and with each shot, one by one, the screams went silent. Pa stayed behind the wheel of his patrol car, terrified that if he stood up, the shooter would get him too. Minutes go by. He hears footsteps, and when he looks up, he sees Henry Crow with an old bolt action in his hands. He takes one look at Pa, who's too terrified to do anything but stare back at him, and takes a look at the wounded and dead deputies. All he says to Pa is, You need to get him to a hospital and then starts on dragging the bodies of the lynch mob back towards his house. Pa knew he was right, so that's what he focused on, and praise be, the wounded deputy survived his injuries. It also turned out the little girl who went missing, she didn't actually go missing at all. Get this, she was hiding in her closet after an argument with her sister over whose turn it was to play Barbie dolls. All she had was hurt feelings, and when all was said and done, she was fine. But who wasn't fine was Hold Williger and his gun-toting buddies, who were all still up at the old crow place. 
Some heavily armed state troopers drove over to the place aiming to arrest Henry on suspicion of murder. Pa said it would have been an open and shut case of self-defense had it come to any court proceedings, but the state of Texas can hardly let a massacre occur without at least looking into it, at least not back then anyway. But when they got there, Henry was gone. They never did find him either, but what they did find were the mutilated remains of Holt Williger and his buddies. Each had been scalped, beheaded, and their limbs ripped off. Their heads were resting atop their limbless bodies while their arms and legs had been burned in a large fire pit. The troopers fanned out looking for Henry, but a lean dog runs fast, as they say. And a lengthy inquiry concluded that while Henry's actions had been indisputably barbaric, he had every right to defend himself from an armed incursion onto his own land, especially if that armed incursion had involved the death of a deputy sheriff. And as a result, he was never declared wanted, and the brutal deaths of Holt and his buddies were ruled as justifiable homicides, which, as the saying goes, is close enough for government work. As you can rightly figure, me and my brother hung on to every word that came out of our pa's mouth telling that story. We knew that he'd seen some stuff, but we had no idea that he'd been involved in something so god-awful as that. I can understand why he hadn't told us anything like that growing up either. I know I wouldn't have been equipped to deal with it, you know, and knowing my pa was in that kind of danger on a daily basis, I don't think that I'd ever have slept again. I sometimes wonder about Henry Crow and how the end of his story went. I hope he found a measure of peace in this world, but I bet the farm that he spent his final days far away from any other person. I was adopted as an infant and had known my entire life. When I turned 21, curiosity got the best of me and I decided to search for my biological parents. I went to the adoption agency and they contacted my mother on my behalf. I soon received a letter from her inviting me to visit her in my neighboring state. My adoptive parents explained the reasons behind my adoption and the limited information they had. I had a few older half-brothers and a sister and my biological father had disappeared, leaving them in a bad financial situation. My biological mother confirmed this in her letter and we had made plans to fly out for a visit. I arrived and we had dinner where I met my biological mother, her now husband, two of my brothers and my sister along with a few nieces and nephews. My biological mother explained that the third brother was unsure about meeting and probably would not be coming. We talked about our lives and got to know each other as the night went on. Eventually everyone went home and I went to sleep for the night. The next morning, I went downstairs and my sister and biological mother were finishing up some breakfast in the kitchen. We sat down to eat and planned for the day. We were interrupted by the front door slamming and we turned to look. Sam, you came. Biological mom said with a smile. He looked at me and rubbed his face. There's just a lot of emotion about this, he said as he slunk into the living room and turned on the computer. We continued our breakfast and my brother sat glued to the computer for the rest of the morning, ignoring me except for the occasional glare. We went out and enjoyed ourselves for the rest of the day and I took my flight home the next day as planned. I continued to talk on the phone or through Facebook with them over the next couple of years. My sister eventually moved to the same state but seemed uninterested in meeting up. She mentioned that my younger brother, Sam, had some issues. I soon found out that he was in my state now as well and was homeless. I offered him the spare room in the apartment my then boyfriend and I lived in and he accepted. We spoke a bit and it seemed like we were starting to get along. My boyfriend helped him to find a job at his company and things were going really well for a while. We didn't ask for any money for rent and I made meals for all of us. One day I returned home from my college classes to find him and my boyfriend arguing about something. He slunk into his room and my boyfriend wouldn't tell me what they had argued about. A few days later, Sam disappeared and took all of his things with him. My boyfriend then explained that Sam thought that I was not really his sister and was somehow trying to scam the family. Another year passed and I was given a job offer in the same city where my biological family lived. They offered to let me stay until I found a place to live there. They were excited to have me come as they wanted to spend time with me and get to know me better. 
My biological mom told me that Sam was living there as well, and I was fine with that. My boyfriend and I had split up, and I was ready to start fresh. From the time I arrived, he would spend most of his time on his computer or just glaring at me. Once in a while, he asked for a cigarette, and I gave him some, and soon I noticed them missing from my room when I was out and about. I confronted him about it, and he admitted to stealing them and apologized. My stepdad put a lock on my door so I would be able to lock it when I was out and also gave me a small mini fridge to put some snacks and drinks in if I wanted. Soon my brother began to mutter about cups going missing and I ignored it, unsure of what he was talking about. I didn't leave the bedroom door locked when I was home and only used it for going out at first. One night, he charged into my room ranting about me scamming them. He was holding a large kitchen knife and waving it around. I froze, realizing that he seemed to be very drunk. I know you're not my sister. You need to leave now. And with that, he charged at me, plunging the knife into the bed about half an inch from my head, screaming, and held back tears as he stormed away. Feeling obviously unsafe, I slipped out and found myself walking to the 24-7 McDonald's at the end of the road. I stayed there a while, sipping on a soda and snacking on fries, and once daylight returned, I went back to the house and told my biological mother what had happened. I told her I would go stay in a motel until I found something. She refused. She insisted he was just a nasty drunk and nothing like that would ever happen again. I agreed to stay but avoided Sam from that point on and kept my door locked when I knew that he was around. Several weeks passed and things were pretty much normal. My brother still glared at me from time to time and would make comments about cups going missing again, insinuating that I was the one stealing them. One evening, biological mom and stepdad were planning to go out with friends. They asked if it would be okay if they let my stepdad's sister stay with me until they returned. She was mentally disabled and needed some support, but nothing too difficult. I told them I was fine with it and they left us. I knew my brother was skulking around somewhere but ignored him. I asked my stepdad's sister if she'd like to go to McDonald's for dinner and she nodded excitedly. We walked and got her food. She happily chatted about the field across the street with hay and how she'd like to see the animals eat it. We returned home and she settled down to watch TV while I went upstairs to work on my laptop, leaving the door unlocked in case she needed me. About an hour later, my door flung open, revealing Sam holding a large black trash bag. You're going to clean this room now and give me all the cups. He snapped, glaring at me as usual. What are you talking about? I have one cup up here that I'm actively using. I said, confused looking around the reasonably clean room. Return them now. You've been scamming us from day one. He shouted. What are you even here for? What are your motives for finding us? Seriously? I was curious about where I came from. Why do I need a motive? I asked, starting to feel annoyed with him. Well, that's not good enough. Seriously? I took you into my home when you were on the streets. No questions asked. If I was scamming you, why would I spend my own money without asking for a dime in return? Not even a thank you. Yes, you did because you're my sister. He snapped. You keep accusing me of not being your sister. I said. I did a DNA test, and it came back 99% that you are. He exclaimed dramatically, as if expecting me to be shocked by the revelation. And how exactly did you get my DNA? I got the hairs from the shower. Don't you know how DNA works, you idiot? He screamed, and he shoved me. I fell against the footboard and cried out as it painfully connected with my back. Crumpling on the floor, I couldn't react before he was on top of me, his hands squeezing my throat as he continued to curse at me. I struggled against him, finally managing to create enough space to knee him hard in the stomach. However, he was unfazed. I continued to fight and scratch at him as he continued to choke me. Desperately gasping for air, I mustered all of my strength and landed one last knee to his groin, causing him to cry out and release his grip. I ran out of the room and grabbed my stepfather's sister, guiding her into another bedroom and locking the door behind us. She began panicking upon seeing the scratches and bruises forming around my neck. I called 911 as he started pounding on the door. It felt like an eternity until the police arrived. I heard them announce their presence as they made their way in, calling out Sam's name. 
One officer knocked on the locked door announcing themselves again. Slowly I opened the door. Sam had attempted to flee when the police arrived but they apprehended him in the backyard. I provided them with my statement and they took photos of my injuries. After ensuring our safety they left. When I informed my biological mother of what had happened she became upset that I had called the police. Although she apologized later I decided it was just best to leave and since then I have had no contact with my biological mother's side. However, I was able to connect with my relatives on my biological father's side who ironically turned out to be the kindest and most accepting people I'd ever known. Despite my father being a bad influence, they have always made me feel like a valued member of the family from the very beginning. So let me tell you about the incident that made me want to get sober. So it was 1999 and I had just dropped out of college. I was living with an old high school buddy of mine in this Fresno trailer. A big part of the reason that I dropped out and a big reason he never made it to college in the first place was that we were both dedicated psychonauts, quote unquote. We were adventurers, committed to the exploration not of outer space, but inner space. Now I get how cringeworthy that sounds today, but back then we thought we were it, man. Some people just dip their toe into the psychedelic waters, but we went deep, really deep. We sampled a whole bunch of tryptamines, from psilocybin to dimethyltryptamine. We even got our hands in a little foxy maloxy one time, which had been known to put inexperienced users in the hospital. Then came the ergolins, like LSD and its more natural cousin LSA, which we derived from importing Hawaiian baby woodrow seeds. We had particular fun experimenting with phenolthiamines too, which is your mescaline, 2CB, and other less aggressive compounds. But our holy grail, the thing we always wanted to get our hands on, is a compound known as dragonfly. It might sound like something from a novel, but I can assure you that there really is a hallucinogenic drug called dragonfly. You might have to look it up to get a proper description of it, but just to summarize, it's a chemical compound that was first synthesized in 1998, just a year before me and my buddy Aaron got our hands on some. It might have a scary sounding name, but dragonfly is called so because its chemical structure resembles a dragonfly, or at least the tripping chemist who invented it thought so. And so here we are. Anyway, Dragonfly is only about 30% as strong as LSD, but you're steadily tripping for a couple of days at a time. You're tripping when you dream, you trip when you wake up, tripping when you cook and eat and go to the bathroom, and slowly but surely, the trip wears you down. To put it simply, when you ingest a chemical compound like LSD or Dragonfly, your body works overtime to try and cycle it out of your system. It's this new icky thing, so better safe than sorry, your body might think, but with Dragonfly, the slow release forces your body to be like, okay, this isn't going to kill me, and there's too much to get rid of, so I just better conserve energy and just stop fighting it. And that's when things get weird, especially around the 48 hour mark. To prep for our multi-day trip, we hit up the local Walmart with the money that we had left over and picked up a whole load of essentials. We had a whole bunch of food, bottled waters, some feel-good kids movies just in case the trip started to go bad at any time. We also decided to set up a shop in Aaron's aunt's trailer which was safely sequestered from the rest of civilized society. We didn't want anyone catching on to the fact of what we were doing as that always brought bad vibes and what brought even worse vibes was having to talk to the cops while tripping so we had to be almost totally alone and unbothered during the whole thing. The trailer was perfect for that. Isolated, but not too isolated. We'd have the woods to explore, a babbling brook nearby, and it was perfect for that purpose. And when the time came to drive out there with our trunk full of supplies, I was the most excited I'd ever been to trip. Excited, but also a little apprehensive, you know? Unlike a lot of other hallucinogens, Dragonfly has a relatively high toxicity, and by the time we took it, it had already killed someone over in Europe after they mistook it for something else, I guess. Overdoses were shown to cause tissue necrosis in the arms and legs, meaning your limbs rot and have to be amputated to save your life. Other overdoses had people almost choking on their own vomit or having near-fatal seizures, and it should be noted that vomit was bright red with blood. 
I read one account, years after I tried it, that said a bad dragonfly trip was like being dragged to hell and back again, many times. It's the most evil thing I have ever tried, and it lasted an eternity. At this point, you might be asking yourself, why the hell would anyone want to risk losing their mind or even your life just to feel something so arguably terrifying? Well, it's because we were very confident that we could keep our dosages correct and not do anything too stupid. We were experienced psychonauts by that time, so the idea of overdosing or jumping off a building was totally out of the realms of possibility. In fact, just in case it isn't obvious, this story isn't about us suffering any of those negative, OD-related side effects. So sorry to disappoint you if you're hoping to hear about us dying. Instead, this story is about something else which happened during our trip, and this is the thing that made me want to get sober, completely straight-edge kind of sober too. So, like I'd already talked about, Dragonfly doesn't quite hit you as hard as LSD, not at first anyway, so we spent our first day kind of mellow, smoking a little grass, and otherwise keeping a chill. We dosed around 5pm, went to bed at around 5 in the morning, and pretty much did the same thing the whole next day. But that day is when the effects really started to take hold. There'd be times when I'd be cruising alone, steady tripping, but nothing major, and then boom, Everything started to feel a little more fluid, and I kind of felt like I was walking in mud, if that makes sense. The feeling would stay for maybe 30 minutes at a time, then I'd start to level off again. Other than that, it was another day of snacking, giggling, and generally trying to stay in a happy, positive place. I didn't remember any of my dreams from the first night, but the second night, wow, they were on another level. It was pure lucid dreaming but the scope and scale of everything was just phenomenal. Gargantuan, vine-infested red rock structures inhabited by these huge behemoths. I wrote all my dreams down when I woke up, and up until that point, I think it was one of the best trips I'd ever experienced. I mean, I can get why people freak out after tripping steadily for so long, because waking up was like the dream hadn't actually ended. I was just in a different place in time. A less experienced psychonaut might have really wanted to tap out at that point, but for me, it was the kind of trip I'd been looking for. They say the longer you meditate for, the more you feel the benefits, and I feel the same way about tripping. So yeah, on the second day, I woke up and wrote down my dreams, had a little breakfast, took a shower, and I'm still enjoying the whole thing. Aaron, on the other hand, his dreams were considerably harsher than mine, and he was worried about his trip taking a bad turn. Now with that in mind, we stuck to those feel-good kids movies, broke into our snack stash, and tried to avoid any negative vibes. But no matter how hard we tried, Aaron just couldn't get out of his funk, and fearing that a bad trip might last for literally days, he pulled the equivalent of smashing the emergency glass and went off into the trailer's bedroom to chill in the dark with some music. I didn't mind being alone, I was still enjoying myself, but after a few hours of my own gorging on candy and sodas, I went on a major sugar crash and decided to just take a nap. And that is where the trip got pretty intense. I was having the wildest dreams, stuff that centered around interacting with beings from another dimension. I remember finding their appearance very frightening at first, but they seemed friendly, although we never found a way to properly communicate. They used a very intricate language and all their frames of reference were different to mine, so it was friendly but just tough. I don't know how long I napped for, but when I woke up, it was dark outside, and I had that freaky dream to reality transition again. I understand that I was no longer dreaming, so I wasn't expecting to see anything hallucinatory, but when I walked into the trailer's like main living space, something was sitting on the couch. Again, I was kind of frightened to see it at first, I'd never gone so deep as to hallucinate an actual person or life form. I think I might have freaked out if I was a little less experienced, but I knew enough to know that what I was looking at wasn't real, and that it was quite possibly one of the beings from my dream having sort of slipped into real space. I tried my best to keep calm, not for one moment thinking that something was actually wrong, and sat down on the seating opposite the being. What followed was almost exactly like my dream. I was speaking, but it was like the being couldn't understand me, and every time they spoke it just sounded garbled. I remember laughing at one point because something the thing said sounded funny to me and I was trying so hard to communicate with something that wasn't real that it was actually kind of hilarious to me. 
The thing started laughing too, mimicking me, only it really wasn't mimicking me because it was me. I guess that might sound completely silly to some people, especially if you're not into psychedelics, but I'm just trying to explain how I felt in the moment compared to how I felt about it afterwards. Anyways, I just sort of hung out with the thing in my head for a while, but after I gave up trying to talk to it, it stood up and made some kind of gesture like it wanted me to watch it. This being started reaching into its mouth, then gently spitting out little jewels on the coffee table in front of me. They were this light glowing blue, almost like the Pacific on a clear day, you know? I actually wished it was real in that moment. Those things would have sold for millions apiece, I thought, and I suddenly found myself needing to touch the little jewels. It was almost like a, can I wake myself up from this kind of moment? If I made my brain realize that they weren't really there, maybe I could move my trip along or something. But when I reached out and tried to touch the little blue jewels, I found that I was actually able to touch them. And that constituted completely new ground for me, being able to actually feel something in my fingertips that was a total fabrication from my own mind. I'd never experienced anything like it before, and it was as frightening as it was exciting. The little jewels were warm and slimy to the touch, but they were so brilliantly shiny that I couldn't keep my eyes off of them. Somehow, I got it in my head that if I could really feel them, they must be real, and that somehow my dream was bleeding into real space entirely. You gotta really understand me when I say that, as dumb as it sounds, I thought I'd crack the code to manifesting objects from my mind in the physical space, like I believed that with my whole heart and soul and wasn't a trip anymore. I was a modern day psychedelic alchemist and I'd made a scientific breakthrough so immeasurably valuable that I was going to be richer than my wildest dreams. But obviously I was high. I remember rushing around for something I could put the little jewels in, something secure that I wouldn't lose. And then I rushed back to the sitting area and carefully began to put the jewels inside of what I later discovered was a half empty jar of peanut butter. I don't know what I was thinking, but hey, I was tripping balls, so give me a break. I then stashed the peanut butter somewhere and went back to thank the being for the gifts. I then watched as the thing phased through the door and sort of out of existence. I remember crying a little, as humiliating as that is to admit, but like I'd already said, I genuinely believed that I'd experienced something truly groundbreaking, and I actually had something tangible to show for it. I can't remember what time it was by that period, but... It was dark, and I was exhausted, so after a quick amount of food, I took a shower and then went back to sleep. A few hours later, I think it was around dawn from the touch of blue in the sky I noticed outside, and I woke up feeling terrible. I went to the bathroom, puked, and then on my way back, I realized Aaron was nowhere to be found. He had been in the bedroom when I passed out earlier, and now he was completely gone. He hadn't tried to wake me up at all, so I didn't figure that it was any kind of emergency, just that he'd gone out for a little walk in the morning or something. Even if he had, I was in no state to go find him, so I stumbled back to bed with a glass of water and went back to sleep. I woke up 12 hours later. I wet the bed, but it was a lot less than it had been the night before, I guess. The dragonfly was finally working its way out of my system, I thought, and I was finally starting to feel a little bit more lucid. It was actually kind of a relief. I mean, I was way into the whole tripping scene back then, and three days straight was just about as much as I could handle. First thing I did was grab a bottle of cold brew out of the mini fridge and then sat on the toilet, drinking it while I was doing my business. I then took a shower dried off while experiencing waves of trippiness come and go and then decided to make myself something to eat. As soon as I walked into the trailer's little kitchen area, I saw it. Fingerprint smears of something dark and syrupy on one of the cabinets. I really hoped it wasn't what it looked like, but it was. It was a very warm evening, warm in the trailer too, and I could smell the blood as I peered at it closer and closer. I started to panic following the trail of blood to the coffee table and noticed that there were smears of blood on the trailer's front door too. Now I'm really panicking because I'm thinking it's Aaron's blood and that he's hurt and or in trouble or something. I go back to the cabinet, open it up and there's my jar of peanut butter with my jewels in it with the same bloody smears all over it. 
I was almost too scared to open it up, but when I did, there were the same drops of blood mixed in the peanut butter. And after fishing around in that thick mess for a moment, I pulled out something small and hard. I wiped off a little of the peanut butter enough to know that it wasn't some fourth dimensional gemstone as I thought it was, but I still couldn't quite tell what it was. It was only when I washed it off in the sink that I realized what it was. It was a human tooth. Like I might have mentioned, my first thought was that Aaron was hurt, so I did like two or three laps around the trailer, calling out to him, but he was nowhere to be found. This was before your average bum like us could afford a cell phone or anything like that, and we'd deliberately chosen the trailer because there wasn't access to a phone inside of it. There were payphones near the trailer park's little office thing, but none inside Aaron's aunt's trailer, and that meant that I had to stay there, freaking out, not knowing what the hell to do for God knows how long before he finally returned, safe and sound. It turns out that he'd gone off to buy some medical supplies, the one thing we hadn't thought of because he thought it was me who had pulled my own teeth out after my trip took a bad turn. He didn't have the money for a dentist, but he did have the money for a few bandages, and he pushed through the peak of his trip in a total panic in order to get me some help. I don't know how he didn't get picked up by the cops, but he was incredibly relieved to find out I was okay, and the feeling was mutual, but the question was still there. If they weren't any of our teeth that I'd stuffed into that peanut butter, who do they belong to? You can call me slow if you want, and it is what it is, I guess, but I only really put it together in that moment. The being that I'd seen, the one I'd assumed that phased out of my dream, that had actually been a real person. I couldn't communicate with them because I was tripping balls and neither could I understand them for some reason. I don't know if they were asking for help, if they were something wrong with them, or how in God's name they ended up taking their own teeth out. I don't even know if the actual extraction happened in front of me, but I know it must have been fresh because Jesus Christ, there was a lot of blood around the trailer. There was no way that we were going to go to the cops either. Both of us had a history with them, so... We weren't about to go inserting ourselves into whatever kind of bad juju went down that night. We just cleaned up the trailer as best we could, caught a ride back into the city, and then tried our best to just forget about the whole thing. We were actually due to stay another night, and there's no way that we should have been driving in that state that we were in, but there's also no way that we were about to stay another night in that place. I mean, would you? Like I said... The whole incident played on my mind so much that it became a sort of catalyst to my sobriety. I still think about it a lot too, as you can probably tell, which is ironic I guess because I don't ever want to know what really happened that night, and if I really did have someone rip their own teeth out in front of me for whatever reason, I'm glad that I was so out of it that I didn't realize what was going on. Before I started my own business, I spent two years working as a lathe machinist for various manufacturing plants in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And for those of you that don't know, a lathe is a kind of machining tool primarily used for shaping metal or wood. It works by rotating whatever you're making around a stationary cutting tool, mainly to remove unwanted pieces of metal, and there are all kinds of different lathes for different purposes. Smaller ones for smaller parts than huge ones for making automobile parts. But whatever the type and function, they all operate using this basic holding and rotating mechanism. You might call it the mother of machining tools, and they've been in use in some form or another for hundreds of years, really. Which is kind of ironic, considering just how freaking dangerous they can be. In a vocation where almost all manufacturing machines have evolved to be as safety conscious as possible... There's just no replacing the lathe with something 100% foolproof. Because of how fast the moving parts are, especially those designed for metal cutting, there's always a risk of being hit by loose objects or by poorly secured or oversized work pieces. But the real risk, when it comes to working with lathes, is getting clothing entangled in the moving parts. Those kinds of accidents are extremely rare, but as any risk assessor will tell you, that actually increases the chances of them occurring. Sometimes, if a person gets too comfortable working with a the machine, they get complacent, and when they get complacent, they get killed. 
So towards the end of my career as a machinist, I was working with this huge lathe that made hinges for shipping container doors. It was massive, twice the size of even the biggest lathes I've worked with previously, but after working with it for nine hours a day, week in and week out, it became just another familiar piece of equipment. I was almost done with this one particular workpiece, and the last step was to polish it a little, so I took a long piece of what we'll call emery cloth and threaded it around the workpiece while it was still held in place by the lathe. The idea was then to hold on to each end of the cloth really tight while the lathe spins the piece around really fast to polish the metal. Only in my case, the lathe finished up a previous cycle that I'd paused, not cancelled, and spins my cloth so that the left side pulled all the way into the lathe where it bites down on the tips of the first two fingers of my left glove. Now I shouldn't have been even wearing gloves in the first place, especially not ones two sizes too big for me, but as I said, comfort breeds complacency. And the second the lathe bit down on the loose fabric was probably one of the most terrifying moments of my life. I'd been through a ton of safety briefs and was warned over and over that accidents with lathes meant amputation or death. One guy just never got tired of telling us, you will lose an arm if you do X, Y, or Z. So obviously this is in the forefront of my mind when I feel the tips of those glove fingers pinch. But by some miracle, I jerked my hand back just at the right moment and it slipped out of the loose glove before the lathe could burn my hand into a slice of pastrami. If my boss hadn't been too cheap to buy me a pair of gloves that actually fit, or I'd been a sucker enough to buy some out of my own money, that lathe might have completely crushed my arm, and I might be pushing daisies right now. I was embarrassingly shaken up afterwards, and my boss was nice enough to send me home for the rest of the day on full pay. I accepted his offer, and I figured that I was fine a few hours later, but in the days that followed... I started actually reflecting on just how lucky I'd been. A big part of that was, as bizarre as it sounds, searching Google for footage of lathe accidents. Now I know it might be tempting to go search for the kind of videos I'm talking about because they are out there, but I'm telling you guys, don't do it. They have to be some of the most horrific injuries you've ever seen, not because of how gory or gruesome they are, but how fast they happen. What's worse? is there's always this moment when the person realizes that they're about to lose their finger or hand or arm or whatever, and they're doing everything they can to stop it happening, but it's just hopeless. Some bleed to death before the EMTs even get there, barely able to get out a cry for help before they go into shock and just collapse. I know it sounds crazy to do that to myself over and over again, but every time I watched a person get hurt and thought, that could have been me. And then surprise, surprise, I completely psyched myself out of working with machines and quit the machine shop just with zero notice. My boss would have been angry if I hadn't spoken with him the weeks before I quit, mentioning that I might not be able to go on anymore. Those were my exact words too. I don't have to elaborate anymore on that, so I think he took that as a verbal notice period because he was cool with me leaving to find some other means of putting food on my table. I work in phone and laptop repair now. It makes me money, but I don't love it like I used to love shop work. It's a different environment in more ways than one, but as much as I miss the kind of shop banter that you have with the guys, there's no chance of a laptop ripping my arm off anytime soon. My great uncle recently passed away, so I thought I'd share a story that he told me a couple of years before he died. He had a stroke towards the end of 2021, so we knew that we only had a little amount of time with him left, so me and my sister made an effort to visit him as much as possible over his last 18 months or so. We brought him his favorite foods, brought close and distant relatives to his home and back, and talking to him at length about all kinds of different topics. He wanted to know what we were in life where we were headed and what our goals and ambitions were now that we were fully grown adults. But there was also plenty of chit-chat about him too, especially the chapters of his life we weren't familiar with. And one of those chapters involved something so terrifying that I don't think our generation can even imagine it. The May Blitz of 1940. Our granddad on our mum's side had died when we were still young, so we had to get all of this info from Uncle Freddy, 
We knew our hometown had been bombed during World War II, but we had no idea how badly. So as he began to talk about what it was like to live through, our jaws just hit the floor. Uncle Freddy said it started when he was about nine, during the late summer of 1940, when the first German warplanes were spotted in the skies over Liverpool. His only real memory of the first few air raids were hearing the sirens and then rushing to the local air raid shelter to take cover. But after a while, his mom stopped taking him to the air raid shelter and made him and his brother, our granddad, take shelter under the kitchen table. We obviously want to know why she decided against an actual bomb shelter in favor of a piece of wood, and Uncle Freddy told us that it was because one bomb shelter not too far away had received a direct hit killing almost 150 people, but not all at once. Those who weren't killed by the explosion were basically buried alive, and after that some people preferred their chances in their own homes. Then there was the time around Christmas when he and his brother got caught out of their neighborhood when the air raid siren started. Sometimes the siren would go off and it was just a false alarm, but that time it wasn't, and he saw something I'm glad I'll never have to see. There were literally hundreds of planes in the distant skies, and my great uncle and granddad could hear the deafening roar of their engines as they approached. It had to be about 4.40 to 5 p.m. too, because Uncle Freddy said the skies were still light enough to see all the planes approaching, but dark enough to see all the anti-aircraft fire shooting up into the air. I honestly can't even imagine how terrifying that must have been, and to think that they were still just kids when it happened, it blows my mind. But then, the bombing itself isn't the story I want to share with you today. The Blitz just provides the backdrop for one of the more shocking stories that Uncle Freddy told us. As you can probably imagine, life went from relatively normal to post-apocalyptic, and it did so almost overnight. Then imagine varying degrees of bombing, night after night, for like six months straight. At one point, the city's prison was bombed, killing some prisoners while others escaped. Most of the city's police force was off fighting the war, and had to be reinforced with volunteers known as air raid wardens. They were well-meaning but definitely unsuited to fight crime, so as a result, crime went through the roof. We like to think that people banded together during those times, the spirit of the Blitz and all that, but according to Uncle Freddy, that didn't extend to everyone. Others took advantage of the lack of law in order to steal from each other, run ration card scams, all sorts of dodgy stuff that made life even harder for those around them, but then there was the other kind of criminal, not the gangster kind, but the monster kind. Uncle Freddy told us the story of one family and the nightmare they endured during one particular bad air raid. Like most other families, the man of the house was off helping with the war effort, leaving his poor wife alone with her four children. One night on December of 1940, the family heard the familiar sound of the air raid siren, but also the sounds of bombs exploding in the distance. Knowing that it wasn't a false alarm, the woman rushed to gather up her four children, then ran to the local air raid shelter to take cover. When they arrived, they piled in with everyone else, then listened to the bombs fall around them while they prayed for safety. However, at some point, the woman noticed that one of her children, a little girl named Elsie, was missing. She searched the cramped air raid shelter, calling out to little Elsie, but she couldn't find her anywhere. Uncle Freddy told us that people in the air raid shelter had to grab onto Elsie's mother to stop her from running outside to look for her, knowing that doing so would mean certain death. The air raid lasted all night, but once the all clear was sounded, there was no rest for some. Elsie's mother went off looking for her, joined by many of her friends and neighbors, and later that day, they found her. Elsie's body was found in the rubble of a bombed out house, and Although she had injuries consistent with rubble falling on her, that wasn't what killed her. The bruising around her neck showed that she'd been strangled, and the other injuries she had don't bear repeating among civilized people, but let's just say the local community was as horrified as they were furious when they heard the news. The police promised to do everything they could to catch Elsie's killer, but everyone knew it was nothing but hot air. Uncle Freddy said the police couldn't have caught a cold during those days, let alone any actual criminals. You had to be caught red-handed doing something, but if you were, the sentences were harsh. Anyway, a few weeks go by, Elsie's killer still hadn't been caught, and people were fast losing hope of them ever being brought to justice. 
People moved around a lot during that time, not to mention that they were killed on a nightly basis too. There was every chance that the person who'd strangled little Elsie had been killed by an air raid, maybe even the same night she was killed. After all, if he'd snatched her up or dragged her off before entering the air raid shelter, they must have both been outside while the bombs were falling. With that in mind, people were quickly moving. There was just so much death at that time, and people were definitely still outraged, but I suppose everyone was dealing with something at that time, and and just try dusting for fingerprints in the rubble of a bombed out building. But then, one night a few hours after the all clear had been called, Elsie's mom was getting ready for a few hours of sleep when there was a knock at the door. Air raid wardens sometimes called at odd hours to pass on information or warn people about their lights being too bright, so although she wasn't expecting anyone, Elsie's mom went to open the door. Standing on the doorstep outside, dressed in dark clothing with their faces partially covered were two men. They asked who she was and when she told them, they invited her to watch the hanging of her daughter's killer. As you can imagine, this probably shocked Elsie's mother, who had many questions of her own, but to cut a long story short, a neighbor agreed to watch Elsie's surviving children and she went with the men to listen to what they had to tell her. No one knows exactly what she was shown or told that convinced her but they took her to the top of a hill on a spot of Parkland, one overlooking the numerous streets and houses below, and showed her her daughter's killer. Rumor has it that the men were all part of a smuggling operation, beer, cigarettes, you name it, and one night, one of their number had come to them saying that they had a little girl to sell. Naturally, the others were horrified and told the man to take her back to her mother before a mob came looking for them. Only the man didn't want to go give Elsie back, and instead he did something unspeakable and unforgivable. Again, this is all just hearsay at the end of the day. No one knows what happened except for Elsie's mum and the men who fetched her and the dead man they executed in the park that night. No one actually knows if she watched or not or if she even tried to stop the hanging, but the man was found the next morning by an air raid warden still hanging by the rope around his neck. Some even say that he had a sign around his neck, one that said, Merry Christmas to Elsie on it. The police visited Elsie's mum upon learning of the rumors and politely asked her to reveal the men's names. She either didn't know or didn't care to tell them. Either way, that was the end of the matter. Knowing that my grandparents and a big chunk of their generation grew up in that kind of environment, it just doesn't seem real. It's like living in the Wild West or Fallout 4 or something. No law, bandits infesting the ruins of once great cities. Thankfully, both my great-uncle Freddy and my granddad Craig both managed to get themselves evacuated to some family in the countryside, and they lived there for quite a long time to keep them safe from the bombs. But my great-uncle Freddy didn't escape the war unscathed. We always knew him as being deaf, but I just thought that's because he was old. It turns out, he'd always been a bit deaf, thanks to a near miss with a German bomb just before he was evacuated. Apparently he was bleeding from his ears, but his mum couldn't get him to a hospital, so he lived his whole life with people having to shout at him to be heard. Mum thinks that he employed a little bit of selective hearing from time to time, especially when he didn't like what he had to say, but the fact remains, the Luftwaffe took his hearing while he was just a boy. Like I said, it just seems insane what those folks went through, and how normal they all were despite growing up in such madness. But no matter how bad it is that my great uncle lost some of his hearing, it'll never be as bad as what Elsie's mum lost or what Elsie herself went through. I only hope what her killer went through was far, far worse. During my late 20s and early 30s, I had a job as a motor vehicle collision analyst. And just like the name, you might imagine, it's our job to visit the site of fatal vehicle collisions, but the specifics of the job involve assessing the cause of the collision in order to provide the policy and judiciary with expert testimony. 90% of the job is exceptionally boring. You pour over stats and figures, fill out piles of paperwork, and are just generally glued to a computer screen. But then for the other 10%, you see some of the most horrifying, nightmare-inducing fatalities imaginable. In the four years of doing the job, I 
quite easily saw over a hundred freshly dead bodies. Occasionally a body would end up outside of a vehicle and would be gone by the time I arrived. But the nature of car accidents means that a lot of the time, bodies must be cut out of the wreckage and that can take a long time. I've seen all sorts, decapitation, catastrophic head trauma, impalement, dismemberment, crushes, and burns. I know it's cliche, but it really is true what they say about getting used to it. We were offered all kinds of mental health days and extended leave to help cope with it, but honestly, there's only a handful of bodies that really haunt me, so to speak. And this is the story of one of them. It was late October, and I got a call about a fatal single vehicle incident just off the I-77. The driver had been turning through a shallow S-curve, but her approach had been way too fast. As a result, she failed to properly negotiate the first turn, which is where her vehicle enters a state of what we called critical velocity. And this has a fancy physics-based definition, but in layman terms, it's basically when a vehicle is traveling so fast that the driver just no longer has any control. You reach critical velocity, you're going to crash, period. Anyway, the wheels buckle on the passenger side and she rolls over several times at very high speeds. Had she been wearing her seatbelt, her chances of survival might have been significantly increased, but she wasn't, so during that first roll, she was partially ejected out of the driver's side window. Her skull was crushed between the outside of the door and the road and continued to flop partially ejected as the vehicle rolled. The skull was split from her left eye to the right rear behind her ear. This caused her brain matter to be strewn about the road and car. Her body was eventually thrown from the vehicle and came to rest on the side of the road. I then had to inspect the bodies for evidence of impairment, i.e. empty bottle of booze and pills. I approached the body while she was facing upright on her back and I see how her skull had been cracked wide open. So wide, I could clearly see the inside cavity of the skull with no brain. The brain was deposited in chunks in the road and had a distinct smell. This scene didn't bother me at the time. I would learned to switch my own brain off during this process long before. Hours later, I get home and my wife and kids are in the kitchen doing something incredibly wholesome. They're carving pumpkins for Halloween and I catch them just as they begin to hollow out these two big pumpkins. They asked if I wanted to join them, and I told them I was tired. I work for a paper company in Pennsylvania now. Yes, just like in the office, but not nearly as funny. The pay and the benefits aren't as good, not by a long shot, but I've seen enough death for one lifetime, and what I lost in my salary, I make up for peace of mind. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, or send me a story over email and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, click it or tick it.